For most of us, our only experience with non-human primates comes from the zoo. We see ourselves in the monkeys and apes. Their facial expressions are familiar. We know right away what they mean when they interact with each other. And those housed in groups seem just like families. But what do they really tell us about ourselves? Can understanding their behavior in the wild give us a clearer view of our own nature? Anthropologists are not only interested in the evolution of the human body, they are also interested in the evolution of human behavior. That is, behavior as it has been affected by the selective pressures in the environments of our past. Field studies of free-ranging or non-captive primates emerged in the 1950s and 60s as a way to understand the relationship between anatomy, physiology, behavior, and the physical environment. The idea was that if we could see how these components interact in a natural system today, using our closest living relatives as models, we could better interpret the clues that remain from our own evolutionary history. It's much more difficult to study primates in field settings rather than in captivity. In a captive situation, you can see them anytime you want to see them. They're extremely visible. So the question is, why study primates in the wild? Well, if we're interested in evolution of human behavior and in the evolution of behavior in general, you really need to see that behavior in a natural setting where evolutionary pressures are at work today and where you might be able to imagine the kinds of evolutionary pressures that would have worked in the past. The social structure of a group of animals, its composition, number of members and sex ratio is influenced by several factors including body size, diet, predation and resource availability. Field studies of primates helps us understand how these are related. One approach is to look at a species that lives in several different environments and see how and if the behavior and social structure varies with the environment. I went to Nepal to study the social adaptations of Langer monkeys to high altitude environments and ended up studying a troop of Langer monkeys that lived at between 8,000 and 13,000 feet in the Himalaya. And what I was interested in was how their behavior might be modified to better adapt to that environment. The Langers in the Himalayas are the same species as exist all over India. They look a little bit different. In the Himalayas, they have thicker coats. Their hair is a lot longer. They are actually bigger in body size, especially the males. What we found was that they changed their behavior during the winter time by essentially spending much of their time quietly, solitarily sitting, hunched over themselves, conserving heat, not interacting. They're neither friendly nor aggressive during the winter time. The total number of interactions drops precipitously, and they spend most of their time resting or feeding. Himalayan langurs also experience a two-year birth interval rather than the more common one-year birth interval that's seen in lower climates where it's warmer and there's food year-round. A two-year birth interval allows the babies born in spring to stay with their mother and be nursed through the subsequent winter time so that they have extra help warmth and nutrition to get through their first winter. Studies of what it takes for a primate to survive in a harsh, temperate climate can help us understand what might have been needed for our human ancestors to move out of the tropics and into Europe and northern Asia. The ability to adapt physiologically and behaviorally to diverse local environments is characteristic of primates. In most cases, 
primate species biology is flexible enough to tolerate a range of conditions. The social structure of any primate group is shaped by the particular environment and by the biological and energetic demands of that species. And at the most basic level, it is also shaped by selection that maximizes each individual's reproductive success. Reproductive success refers to having more offspring live to a reproductive age than another individual. It's actually the measure of individual fitness. An individual's fitness is based on the number of their offspring over their reproductive lifetime that are not only born, but live to reproduce themselves. While males and females share the same goal of maximizing their reproductive success, males and females pursue different reproductive strategies. The complex behavioral patterns that contribute to individual success. Female mammals invest heavily in each offspring, while males are usually required only for fertilization. In order to maximize her reproductive success, a female has to be very good at um, growing a baby inside her, taking care of it, training it. Uh, it's a lot of, of extensive behavioral investment in the offspring. For males, what produces a, a greater reproductive success is more opportunities to copulate and uh, or uh, a better success rate at copulation. So for chimpanzees, the, the more opportunities to copulate stems from rank. So the, the dominant male can monopolize a female at times. And male chimpanzees have huge canines and they fight, they're very political, they're driven, intense. Uh, male chimpanzees are all about uh, trying to attain high rank. Many primate social groups include one adult male and several adult females. For example, Hamadryas baboons form one male groups, with females often recruited when they are young. Hamadryas one male groups often include one or more younger males, called follower males, who keep a respectful distance but who clearly belong and stand ready to take over the group should the group leader falter. The closely related Chakma baboon of South Africa lives in larger multi-male, multi-female troops where males actively compete for access to female mates. Chakma baboons live in areas with richer resources and greater risk of predation, an ecological difference that results in a social system where males tolerate other males around them. Among primates, one might expect males to want to live in groups of a bunch of females and just one male, because that way the male can really control uh, the the fatherhood of, of infants born, or he, can, he thinks he can, he can attempt to. The, uh, the th current thinking is that for mammals, uh, certainly for primates, that the strategies of females in terms of finding food are, which they have to then convert into babies, basically. Uh, that's, that's what drives social systems. So with larger groups of females, which form for ecological reasons, uh, you, you start getting multi-male uh, uh, social groups because they did, one male simply can't monopolize that many females. The social organization of chimpanzees is very unusual in, among mammals. They have what's called a fission-fusion system where you have a community, but instead of traveling around together all the time, the members of the community will travel on their own individually for a while, then they run into another buddy, they travel together for a few days. Sometimes you get up to half or two-thirds of a community traveling together. It's believed that this fission-fusion system exists because they're fairly large-bodied and they rely on ripe fruit. And if you have a big body and you need ripe fruit, you frequently run into situations where there's just not enough fruit in a particular tree to go around. So you either stay together and compete intensively and not get enough to eat, or you split up, then you come back to socialize. And, and so it's this very fluid social system. Social structures that involve constant competition for mates can result in sexual selection, a type of natural selection that operates on only one sex in a species. 
This can also lead to sexual dimorphism, which in most mammalian species is expressed in larger size, both body size and size of fighting equipment, such as canine teeth in primates or antlers in deer. Those features that enable a male to successfully compete for females will be more likely passed on, and so will increase in the population over time. Since there are costs to getting bigger and bigger, some species, like these Hamadryas baboons, exaggerate male size through huge manes of hair or longer teeth, both metabolically inexpensive to grow and maintain. In some primates, like marmosets, who pair up and don't experience constant competition for mates, there is little or no sexual dimorphism. Males and females are about the same size. Primate females ensure their reproductive success by competing successfully for access to food and, if needed, to mates who can secure feeding territories. The close bond between a mother and her infant is another way to promote reproductive success, ensuring the infant survives to reproductive age. The mother's body is the first environment experienced by infants, both physically and socially. A primate infant clings to its mother and through this proximity experiences her life as its own. Even after breaking contact and venturing out to play with others, the infant is in fact on its mother's body for most of the day and night. Infants are a source of attraction in some species. Juveniles and sub-adult females may borrow an infant and carry it around, but mothers are never far away and retrieve them quickly. In some species, adult males form special attachments with infants and spend time holding and grooming them. In a few rare cases, such as with tamarins who live as monogamous pairs and often have twins, males share the energetic burden by carrying the infants during their first few months of life. The long juvenile period, in monkeys one to three years, in chimps as long as five to eight years, provides the opportunity to learn and practice physical and social survival skills. Play, first with age mates and then with larger animals, is the primary activity of juveniles, especially males. Play fighting serves to perfect fighting skills, which can help a male later in life compete for access to females. The close bond between a mother and infant lasts throughout the juvenile period. Mothers are a source of comfort and can actively intervene on behalf of their offspring. In species where individuals remain in their natal group for life, a mother's influence is lifelong. In species where there is only one adult male in the group, it is during the juvenile stage that young males begin their exodus by spending increasing amounts of time interacting with other young males, finally moving off to live in all male groups. Most primates live in groups. Groups provide protection against predation, protection against competition for resources from other groups, and opportunities for learning. At the same time, there is competition for resources from other individuals within the group. Primates have evolved complex behavioral systems to deal with daily life in a social group. Zanzibar red colobus monkeys live in groups of 1 to 11 males, with 1 to 47 females per group. About half the time, these groups are split up into smaller foraging parties, feeding on highly clumped food resources. Aggression within these groups is most often over food, as these two females demonstrate. However, sometimes the mere approach of a more dominant animal can cause the other to leave so overt aggression is avoided. Primates have a rich social repertoire, which is learned and practiced during development. These behaviors establish and maintain bonds among individuals, allowing them to coexist by anticipating and manipulating the effects of their behavior on others. Dominance hierarchies express the relative status among individuals in a group. With status can come preferential access to resources of various kinds, including access to mates. Dominance hierarchies actually reduce aggression within a group by establishing where each individual stands relative to the others, so it is clear to all. 
Here, an adult male presents his hindquarters to another male in a gesture that conveys non-aggression to the other male. In Zanzibar red colobus, males are generally tolerant of other males in their group, but form coalitions against males from other groups. Affiliative behaviors establish and maintain social bonds, including hierarchical relationships. Grooming is one of the most common affiliative behaviors among primates. While grooming serves to remove dirt and parasites on the skin, it also strengthens social bonds by providing pleasurable experiences among individuals. White-faced capuchins rub themselves with the sap of the gyapanol tree. The sap likely serves as an insect repellent, but the behavior involved in applying the sap serves another function as an affiliative activity that involves group members in a socially exciting and bonding experience. As social animals, primates have evolved complex systems of communication involving sight, sound, and smell. Group living diurnal primates with excellent visual acuity are highly dependent on visual communication, gestures, posture, and facial expressions. This is especially true of species that live on the ground with easy visibility between group members. And not looking is an important communicative act too, as we can see in these langurs, who adjust their location and posture to each other without direct visual signals. Another way primates communicate is by smell. Communication by smell is most commonly used among the prosimians many of whom have scent glands on the insides of their arms or on their chests or underneath their tails. Communication by scent is communication that lasts. It does not require the sender to be present to make the communication happen. And so it's, it's a way of communicating that you were there. Scent marking is also used by some New World monkeys such as squirrel monkeys who wipe saliva on branches, or this capuchin who rubs urine on himself and the branch. Ah! Vocal communication is a broadcast communication. Everyone within earshot gets the message. Vocalizations are used in aggressive displays. In this case, an adult male Zanzibar red colobus is displaying toward another group even as he retreats. Threat vocalizations often draw attention to a visual signal as well, a canine display. Danger is almost always communicated vocally. Vocalizations also serve as contact calls, keeping the group together in dense vegetation, or helping young animals to locate their mothers, as we see with this Zanzibar red colobus infant. Anthropologists study non-human primates because they are our closest living relatives and can serve as models for understanding how human behavior might have evolved, including that human hallmark, culture. If we want to understand the evolution of human culture, it's very difficult to do that when we only have one species, ourselves, to, to, to look at. Because any story that we make up to explain how we got to be the way we are, uh, as, as long as it's consistent with what we know about humans, how, do you, how would you ever know it was the wrong story? By having a comparison, by seeing similar kinds of things going on in different species, then we can start talking about things like, uh, do, you, do you really need to be smart in order to have culture? Uh, do, uh, what role does communication play in the elaboration of uh, these variants, population variants. Uh, you can start asking comparative questions. So the comparative method is really the only way that we can get at um, a, a reality check on our own stories about ourselves. Early attempts to document cultural behavior in non-human animals focused on tool use and manufacture, since this was once viewed as a uniquely human behavior. Even today, new examples of tool use are being discovered. There are great examples of tool use in, in brown capuchins, so they'll use hammers and anvils, they have stone digging tools and also even crude stone blades that they create. I think if you Google chimpanzee cultures, you'll get to a website that uh, lists uh, 20 or 30 different behaviors 
that are thought to be cultural in chimpanzees. Chimpanzees using sticks to uh, spear bush babies out of holes in trees. And that's never been seen anywhere else after 40 years of studying chimpanzees all across Africa. Any difference in behavior between populations of a single species could be a cultural difference, but anthropologists are most interested in those that do not correspond to differences in the local ecology. In other words, they are more likely cultural. Chimpanzees show uh, a number of behaviors that differ at different sites where it doesn't seem like it's ecologically explained. Maybe the most famous is termite fishing, which is seen at some sites, but at Kibale Forest in Uganda, it's, they're, they're referred to as country bumpkins because they don't use tools to fish for termites. Using stone, hammer, and anvil to crack open oil palm nuts in West Africa, seen at some sites and not at other sites, and, and not seen at all in East Africa or Central Africa, even though stones and oil palms are, are common all the way across. So those, those look like cultural uh, variants. We now know that most of the traditions in non-human primates relate to foraging strategies. But there are some observations of between site differences in communicative rituals as well. And this is fascinating because it means that there can be cultural variation in social conventions, even in species that lack the human capacity for language. My capuchins, the white-faced capuchins, tend to be more innovative in the domain of social conventions. So they create these really striking innovations for testing their social bonds, which spread throughout cliques. Some monkeys have invented this tradition of sticking their fingers up their friend's nostrils, and they'll do this mutually, and it'll last for several minutes. They sort of sway and look a bit ecstatic or trance-like when they do it. And this behavior was really intriguing to me when I first saw it. As it turns out, this behavior has been invented multiple times, but at any of the four sites where my collaborators and I have worked, it is present in some groups, but not other groups. There are other behaviors that my monkeys show that also seem to fall in the same general category. So one is the finger and mouth game, where he'll take his friend's finger, bite down pretty hard, not hard enough to draw blood, but hard enough that it's a major challenge to get that finger out of there. And so the partner will pry the mouth open using hands, the other hand and his feet and mouth and get the finger back eventually over the course of a few minutes. But when he's done, he doesn't run away. He sticks his finger back into play again or they'll switch roles. So the question I'm usually asked is, you know, why? Why did they do this? I think this is all about bond testing. And these behaviors are performed only within pairs that have a fairly comfortable relationship. They're not performed between newcomers. I think the most critical aspect of these Putin signals is that they're unique to particular social relationships. So uh, they have to put a lot of effort, often months, into devising a dyad-specific ritual in each, which each partner agrees on its specific role and the sequence of uh, events in this interaction. That is non-transferable to another relationship. It's uh, a signal of commitment to this particular dyad. Studies of the behavioral capacities of monkeys and apes, and even prosimians, provide a wealth of comparative data for understanding ourselves, our uniqueness, as well as what we share in common with our fellow primates. But one species, the chimpanzee, our closest relative, has always held a special place in anthropology. The study of chimpanzees uh, really took off with the work of Jane Goodall at Gombe National Park. It's a aerial photograph of the park uh, in the early 60s and, and very soon thereafter by uh, Toshisada Nishida uh, working in the Mahali Mountains about a hundred something kilometers away. I think the biggest impact of their work has been the recognition of chimpanzees as individuals with individual life histories, personalities, um, and it, it's a, a level of interest in the complexity of non-humans that wasn't there before. Traditional wildlife biology, you, you study the male elk or the, you know, the, the female uh, ptarmigan or something like that. Uh, and thanks to the work of Goodall and Nishida and, and many more to follow, uh, we now wonder why um, Fifi was such a good mother at Gombe and why she was so successful, whereas uh, Passion was a psychotic uh, cannibal. Uh, those sorts of questions became legitimized, and, and that's 
of course, much more relevant if we're trying to understand the relationship of chimpanzees to humans because we recognize we have personalities and histories and cultures, but now we're being forced to recognize that so do they. Differences between the behavior of humans and other primates are often a matter of degree rather than kind. As animals, we are part of a biological continuum and we share many behavioral traits in common with other animals, just as we share many anatomical and molecular traits. As members ourselves of the order primates, we have more in common with our primate cousins than with any other animals. To understand what it is to be human, we must understand our closest relatives.